Every payload brought to orbit was done so through a rocket. But what happens to the rockets once the payload is deployed? Is low Earth orbit populated with every SpaceX second stage ever launched? In this animation, we'll look at what happens to objects that are left in low Earth orbit, why we couldn't predict where China's out of control rocket would land, and why some objects burn up on re-entry while others don't. It's well known that as you increase your altitude from the surface of Earth, the atmosphere thins. And once you reach space, which is above 100 kilometers in altitude, it's often stated that there is no atmosphere at all. But this is not exactly true. Although air density at this altitude is extremely low, there's still a tiny amount of air particles hundreds and even thousands of kilometers from the surface of Earth. And these very few air particles affect all objects in orbit, continually slowing them down, which lowers their orbit, bringing them closer to the atmosphere. This is known as atmospheric drag. Atmospheric drag, therefore, gives a lifetime to orbits. This decaying life of an orbit is known as orbital decay. Although there are several factors that contribute to orbital decay, which we will get into later, the height of an orbit dictates the rate of decay almost entirely. Let's look at an example of a Falcon 9 that is launching a Crew Dragon capsule to the ISS as an example of atmospheric drag and orbital decay. After stage separation at around 200 kilometers in altitude, while the Dragon capsule continues to raise its orbit to rendezvous with the ISS, the second stage is in a decaying orbit that is projected to last only tens of hours as it collides with the air particles, slowing it down and lowering its orbit. Now the problem with leaving spacecraft in these decaying orbits is this leads to an unpredictable point in time of impact on Earth. As it turns out, it's very difficult to predict the exact lifetime of the orbit when an object will collide with the atmosphere. The reason why it's so difficult to predict the point in time of impact is the other factors that contribute to orbital decay. Apart from altitude, these include the ballistic coefficient of the object, the weather in space, and the varying gravity acting upon the object in orbit. Let's look at each of these briefly. The ballistic coefficient is a formula used to determine an object's ability to overcome atmospheric drag and it's based on three characteristics of the object. First, the drag coefficient is a value dependent on the geometry of the face that is colliding with the air particles. In this case of the Falcon 9 second stage, it would be slightly spherical if it remained in this orientation. Secondly, the cross-sectional area is the surface area of the face that is colliding with the air particles. With the Falcon 9 second stage having a diameter of 3.7 meters, this gives a surface area of 10.75 square meters. The last variable to calculate the ballistic coefficient is the mass of the object, which in this case is just over 3,900 kilograms when taking into account the remaining fuel. The weather in space also plays an important role in an orbit's lifetime, as intense radiation from the sun will increase the collisions with charged particles, contributing to atmospheric drag. Also, the varying gravitational pull from Earth's irregular ellipsoid shape, the position of the sun and the moon, will all pull on the object differently depending on their relative position. These contributing factors make it very difficult to predict the exact point of reentry. This therefore poses a threat to Earthlings, as some parts of the spacecraft, like the composite pressure vessels and engines, are known to not burn up completely through re-entry heating. Much like China's Long Mark 5B's rocket, that posed a threat to populated areas as it tumbled around in an unpredictable decaying orbit before raining down debris near the Maldives. So therefore, to prevent this from happening every SpaceX launch, after separation, the rocket's second stage will flip around using onboard nitrogen thrusters. It then refires its main engine, completing a retrograde burn at a very specific time. This burn will subtract velocity from the spacecraft, which in return lowers its altitude, causing it to quickly collide with the atmosphere at a very specific place, where any residual components that do not burn up will land in designated areas in the ocean far away from people. This process of deorbiting unwanted spacecraft is common with SpaceX, even if the spacecraft doesn't pose a threat to populated areas. Starlink satellites, for example, at the end of their useful life, will use their Krypton ion thrusters to lower their orbit enough to collide with Earth's atmosphere where they are expected to burn up completely. But why is it that some objects burn up completely, some almost completely, while others like the Crew Dragon capsule not at all? Well, if we look closely at the physics behind reentry heating, we see the incoming air particles, represented in blue, bounce off the blunt face of the body and try to get out of the way. 
but the blunt bottom pushes the air particles in the path of the vehicle instead of off to the side. This causes them to now collide with the incoming air particles. The incoming air particles now begin to compress the air and create a boundary layer that is represented by the yellow particles. As the incoming air continues to compress the boundary layer, it creates a highly compressed layer of air particles at the very front of the boundary layer. This is called a bow shock and is represented by the red particles. This extremely high pressure found on the shockwave in return causes extremely high temperatures as the temperature within the shockwave increases by the speed of re-entry cubed. This results in the shockwave reaching temperatures of tens of thousands of degrees. But thanks to the boundary layer holding the shockwave away from the heat shield, only 1-5% to of the thermal energy reaches the heat shield. And through the ablative material of the heat shield, as it heats up, particles of it will flake away, taking heat with them. Now any object that does not have that blunt face and insulative heat shield will be directly exposed to the bow shock and will begin to burn up. And depending on their size, material and insulative properties, parts of it may reach the Earth's surface. While expanding the second stage currently seems advanced for our times, this is all about to change. As SpaceX continues to design their Starship, 100% reusability is the dawn of a new era of space exploration. As always, thanks for watching this animation, and I'll see you on the next one. If you enjoy these animations and would like to support what I do, please consider becoming a member through one of the preferred means below. And a big thanks to those who are already doing so.